Okay, so hello, good evening. We are in week two of our Black History Month virtual conference. I am so, so excited to get this started. Um, we, I, I'm, I'm basically over the moon excited for this one because we are in education mode. I'm an educator along with my fellow educators on the panel tonight. Um, we are gonna be talking about why education is important and what's the point as we all probably heard from our students we've said it probably before to our parents and teachers what's the point of me learning this i'm not going to know this in about 10 years okay that's not really you know the whole basis of conversation is just to see facts and math and stuff there's a real important basis of it when it comes to education so we're going to be talking about that um my name is kavina bullock Miller now. <laughs> um, I am the founder and CEO of Candid Kavina, putting on this panelist um, along with my colleagues and friends. So we are going to get started and do very, very small introductions while we are on here. And I'm going to just kind of go around. Um, so Isaiah, you can go ahead and start first. Very brief introduction, who you are, what you do, and where you're from very quickly. <laughs> hello, hello, Isaiah C. Mason. I am an elementary instrumental music teacher in North Brunswick, New Jersey, uh, born and raised here in Jersey. So uh, graduated from Rutgers and Temple for grad school. Awesome, thank you so much. Just he, he's gonna take the world by storm. So if you wanna get to know him now, just you know, get his autograph while he's- I receive it, I receive it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next up is Jay. Jay Salazar, eighth grade social studies teacher in North New Jersey. Um, I came through the panel via TikTok because I post a lot of teacher content, a lot of um, social justice content, and things of that nature. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, Dr. Ann, you are next on my screen. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Ann DeRosier. Um, I am born in Haiti, raised in Brooklyn, educator for over 10 years, working at all segregated schools in New York. Um, I don't teach anymore. I'm still involved in education, but I am actually programs director at 826 Valencia, which is a company in Cali that helps students with their creative writing, um, was director of education, educational consultant. I write curriculum. I'm here for the kids. I'm here for Kavina and I'm here for the kids. So that's me. <laughs> Yes, here for the kids. I love it. Thank you so much for being on. Um, Atia, you are on next. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Atia McGee. I use they and theirs. I'm a house advisor and system director of residential life at Vassar College. My way of education is working with post-secondary, um, but I'm from the Bronx. So I'm in Poughkeepsie, New York, hour and a half from my childhood home, BD line, bacon, egg, and cheese with ketchup, not hot sauce. Um, and I will rep that hard. I, I'm sorry, Jay. I could do hot sauce, but ketchup is better, and you know it, and you know it. Um, hot sauce. Come on. <laughs> so grateful to be on the panel today. I'm sorry, this one. Breakfast. Let's talk about that. How when we go to school, we was getting the bacon, egg, and yo, let me get the bacon, egg, and cheese, throw it for ketchup. Yeah, and, it's, and, it's one, and it's one word, one word, bacon, egg, and cheese. Bacon, egg, and cheese. <laughs> bacon, egg, and cheese. It's one word. Okay. Let's let's not let's not get it twisted. Thank you so much. We'll have the ketchup hot sauce probably debate probably in the after party or something because I I see that little that's going on there. All right, um, Christina, you are next. Hello, everybody. I'm Christina Daniels. I am an adjunct instructor with Gwen Mercy University. So that's where my teaching comes in. But I've worked in higher education for over a decade. And um, I'm just coming in with a, a little bit of everything. I've been on the distance learning, uh, the, the regular, well, not regular, but when you go traditional in the classroom side. So I'm bringing a little bit of everything today. <laughs> and Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much. We need, we need that mixture in there. So thank you for coming on. Darlene, you are next, recent graduate. <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Darlene Sills. I work um, now with West Orange Public School District. I recently completed my master's at Kane University. Um, thank you. That's actually where me, uh, Kavina, and I met. And um, right now, I'm looking to do something in higher education, um, just applying to different job opportunities now that I have a master's. So, um, so I'm excited about it. Yes, thank you. And I had the honor of like really briefly looking over her thesis. Amazing work. Oh, which yeah. Contributing. Yeah. Oh, you know, it, it was a lot of work. 
a lot of work that was definitely <laughs> worth it. Um, really amazing. Um, Dr. Nail, you are next. I see that you are up here. I made it. Yes, I'm glad. <laughs> issues. I was sitting there going, what in the world? And then I clicked on the link and here I am. So y'all, I am so sorry. We don't do that. We do not do that. So here I am. Again, my name is uh, Dr. Dawn Nail. I am interim director in the Center for Academic Excellence at North Carolina A&T State University. And uh, I think I'm a little bit like you, uh, Ms. Daniels. I am a hodgepodge in, in uh, higher ed. I kind of fell into it. And it wasn't anything that I was looking to do. I came from corporate and uh, ended up being, um, after I got my master's, as someone just said they got their, their master's, Darlene, after I got my master's, I said, what am I going to do? So I did some networking and um, fell into it with uh, one credit hour course and uh, ended up teaching for a little while and then went full time at uh, North Carolina a and in admissions. So I did some admissions, did some communications. That's my background, journalism and mass communication. And uh, we're like twins. We're twins over here. I did the same thing. We'll have to chat. We'll have to chat. <laughs> yeah. So and now I'm in the uh, the Center for Academic Excellence, where I'm working specifically with students, mentoring, tutoring, making sure that they matriculate and uh, they do well while doing so. So nice to meet everybody. Yes. Thank you so so much. Okay, we do have one more panelist that will be on probably a little bit later, but we are gonna go ahead and get started. You all are quite special, not because I'm a fellow educator, so you know, a little bias, but this is the largest panel that we have for the month. Um, I couldn't, I kept adding on people and I'm like, the panel's getting a little big, but I have to add these people in here because um, you all contribute such different things to the conversation. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So. One of the first things I do want to ask, and I'm gonna just start off right off the bat. Um, I really would like to discuss how institutional racism have shown in education, whether it's K through 12 or higher education, admin, anywhere that you feel part of um, in this field, where have you seen it? How have you seen it? I wanna start right off the bat with that. And anybody can jump in whenever they're ready. <laughs> Um, I'll take, I'll at least share what I've seen. Um, so just, I didn't share the grades that I taught, but I started off as a teaching artist and then I, and I taught um, high school social studies. So I, I taught global history and American history. Um, and I also taught middle school. So one thing, um, two things I'll talk about um, are related to curriculum and related to kind of the way that our children are, like our black children are taught. So Obviously, we know that there is a whitewashing of history, and, and so a lot of what is actually fact about, you know, things that would bring pride and instill pride in our, in our children is left out. Um, a lot of the narrative when we're looking at curriculum is from the white perspective, and so very, like, upfront, you know, we're talking about textbooks in Texas you know, saying that slavery was a was the my you know migrant labor, and you know you have the daughters of the Confederacy, which it makes which is a conglomerate of of white women from the South who actually have enough clout to sway textbooks to include and not include certain information and certain facts and what our kids are being exposed to. So that is so the text you know it goes it, it goes from the textbooks to the curriculum writers. You know, curriculum development in education K through twelve is very white. And so any space that is very white, you're going to see that these things are, that are narratives and even narratives of people of color, not just black people, but Japanese people, you know, like Chinese, you know, workers that created the transcontinental railroad, like in Irish, you know, like all of these things that I was able to figure out just by, you know, researching and Googling and kind of putting together my own little curriculum led me to discover that there's a lot of lies out there. Um, and there's, there's half truths that, that prop up whiteness and, and devalue blackness. Um, the second thing I would say where we see institutional racism is really in the standards that are that our students are being taught to and taught at. And the reason I bring this up is because you'll find in a lot of, I taught in charter schools. Um, I have experience working in public schools, but I taught full-time in charter schools. And there are policies in place where parents might not even know this, but teachers do not correct grammar. And, you know, for me, that is egregious. We cannot have seventh grade 
and and it only happens with the black kids you know it's like i don't understand why you're not capitalizing your every sentence starts with a capital every paragraph has an indentation and i'm gonna check that and i and i took time to go over kind of basic skills because what we see happening in education around black and brown bodies is that it's almost like let's glaze over all the stuff that they're going to actually need to show proficiency in the real world and let's just get them to do this test let's just get them to pass this and kind of focus on very discrete things outside of like what they need to survive i can totally agree with what you're saying i teach uh one of the classes that i teach is a student success course and it's a um foundational course that uh, our students get to um, that teaches them communication skills, teaches them networking, just the very foundational things that they need coming into school, but uh, coming into uh, freshman year. So what ends up happening before I can even get into my curriculum is I have to go into two, two, and two, there, there, and there, regional dialects and things like that, because just like you said, those things are glossed over. And it seems like it's okay, but I'm going, it's not okay, not in my classroom, because as soon as you graduate, someone's gonna look at you sideways because you don't know how to spell two, two, and two, or you're there, there, and there is wrong, and your where and where is, is not correct. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I have seen that quite a bit, and, it, and it's not okay. It's not okay. Very, very basic things that our students need to know coming out of K through 12 when they get into freshman year, we have to end up doing remedial work a lot of times because they have just been passed through, and it's not okay. And they're glossed over in the name of acceptance and inclusion when we didn't ask for that. That's not the level of inclusion we want. You know, that's not what we need. We want policy change, but they say, oh, well, we're gonna let them speak with improper grammar to get through school. And then when they go get a job, these same people are saying, you're not educated enough to get our job or you don't speak, you don't fit the part. Um, so just to add on to what um, they were, Dr. Neal and Dr. Ann were just speaking on because that's a very, it's a misconception almost. We talk about what the, the false narrative that they're teaching is goes not just in the history books, but outside of it too, about what life is going to offer them. Um, and my, I'm a music teacher and an instrumental teacher specifically. So in my, my experience, resource, resources have always been what we lack. Um, even in my few years of teaching experience, every year, the, stu the students that can't afford to rent an instrument from the shop are black students and um, other minority students. When we need the money, it's not there. So then I started to ask myself, well, why is that the case? Why do other districts who are smaller than us have the money to um, pay for all these instruments? And I got a, I got a real lesson about the institutional racism. Our, we're funded by property tax. And because of redlining, Af uh, minority communities, their property isn't worth as much and the schools don't get as much funding. And then someone goes and opens a charter school, which takes even more money from the public school, which is, I don't have an issue with charter schools as a whole. I don't, I'm just thinking about the whole, how it's formed, right? Then some charter schools say, well, we're not only gonna take certain kids. You know, they, they have a, they have a, if you don't have a waiver, then our students are still left out um, and excluded and even more. So when you think about the institutional side of it, that's it, and people don't even realize, I didn't realize it for a while. We just thought, oh, we're poor. The school doesn't have any money, but it's why doesn't the school have money? Is, is, and that's really where I see it the most, is just resources are what available. Yes, I'm talking instruments, but we can go and talk and get the updated history books, make sure they get the pencils, make sure they have enough staff, enough buildings, enough, enough space. Um, so that's my ex experience in seeing that. Uh, yeah, I can speak to resources. When I taught in the Bronx for two years, I taught in the Bronx as a special education um, teacher and, you know, a teacher for eight, each trimester, uh, you'd have a total of 2000 pages. And if you've been a teacher printing 2000 pages, you, that can be gone, depending on how you use it in two weeks, three weeks, even three days, depending on how you use paper. And that would be okay if, you know, Wi-Fi didn't um, you know, turn on, on and off every other day. That would be okay if you had computers for your classrooms, which we didn't. 
right? So those those resources as well. And I was teaching at that time. I was teaching when when it was the school was maybe 80 80 percent um, um, Latinx folk, right? And now when I'm going to a school with predominantly Black students, I don't see those uh, those same resource problems. I know we don't have as much as other schools, but it's better than what I had before. Um, and the problems I'm seeing now in the school that I'm working at is curriculum. Same idea that the 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 the, the curriculum I'm given was very was put together by somebody who didn't care with somebody else's name on it from a Google Doc, Google Drive, and I got it three years ago. And I've been working on it every, you know, um, I've been working on it for the last three years and adding counter stories, adding the, adding the, you know, the, um, um, the language and the, and the 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 words of the op of the oppressed trying to say okay we're learning this topic cool but what about the women's point of view great what about the, what happened with the immigrants awesome cool where were black people during this time um and, and no i'm not and i'm not a curriculum um developer so i know even then i'm doing my students a disservice because up there they're not doing the job because it's not important that's where the racism institutional racism shows when even the people who are trying it just is still not enough. I, I just wanted to chime in and say, Jay, no, it is very important. And that is the revolution. I used to tell my kids, I am the revolution, okay? Because the fact that I'm giving you all of this knowledge, I have students to this day that will tell me that because they kept their, first of all, having them take notes and keep their notebook was an accomplishment. So they told me that they kept their notebook. I was teaching um, 11th and 12th grade. And a lot of my students, they went to, they went to college and they said, DeRosier, your notebook saved my life. I took a college level course and I knew a lot of what they were talking about because you taught it. So do not by any means put yourself in the category of being assessed or being evaluated by people who do not care because you being in front of these kids and you doing that work and you finding and digging that information and telling that story, you're changing lives every day. And these kids, they, they might not say it, but trust me, it resonates with them to see people that look like them. And I just think it's unfortunate speaking of resources, that inner city schools are where we have teachers from Teach for America going. The inner city schools are where we have these people that wanna play, you know, they wanna, they wanna be in the playground for a little bit while they figure out what they wanna do if they wanna teach. You know, that's the kids, that's the teachers our kids are getting instead of getting committed people who really wanna do it and wanna stay and, and, and really want to grow in the, in the field and in the profession. So I think speaking of resources, that's another very big thing that we need to talk about and how those teacher preparation programs are really doing our communities a disservice because we're not getting the qualified teachers that our kids actually need. I'm gonna let somebody else speak to that, but I just wanted to say full transparency, 100% Teach for America. I am a I am a career career switcher from uh, 2016. I decided I wanted to be a teacher, but I did see exactly what you're talking about, where teachers were like, "This is a stepping stone. Two years, I'm gonna go to med school. Two years, I'm gonna go to law school." And it was just it was just to help them get a, a grad school degree that they that can help them for the next step. But um, yeah, full trans transparency, people. But there's definitely truth to all of that. Um, I'm just gonna add something slide in because I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if we're gonna switch questions real quick. Um, so I work in higher ed and I was aspiring K through 12 teacher at one point. I was gonna be a biology teacher, teach nutrition, you know, all that stuff. And I said, no, 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 thank you. I'm just gonna work with the college students when they leave the home. And what I've realized about institutional racism is I work at predominantly historically white institutions where I have to remind folks the foundation is whiteness and white supremacy, right? Like black bodies, brown bodies are not supposed to be here, indigenous bodies. Quite literally some, some institutions were built on what they call state like land grant institutions. No, that's stolen land. Like we, we, can, we can say what we want. So institutional racism is in your foundation. Harvard, you know, with the, where they were converting uh, indigenous folks and calling them like um, their, their charity cases in history to this, the very land I occupy now being at the institution I'm at, right? So higher ed institutions were not made for black and brown bodies because we weren't seen as human when some of these schools were developed. And we're still, I would argue, we're still not seen as human. Um, institutional racism, in addition to curriculum, because I work at small private liberal arts schools. So we don't even have curriculum that I remember studying in the Bronx where people would say, if you don't do well, you're gonna take remedial courses. We have no remedial courses here. So if you weren't good at your algebra classes or something and you come here, whatever qu quantitative reasoning uh, class you have, you know, there's no, there's, you take it at community college and maybe come back, but there's no, there's not that here and that structure because of the, the structure of higher ed, right? Um, institutional racism shows up when professors immediately see the black and brown students as deficit 
Like you all have nothing to offer. You're here to learn and only receive because you come from the, um, uh, the, the one narrative story of you come from some poverty driven, trauma centered story where so black bodies are just not only receiving institutional racism in the actual structure of the institution, but they're already seen as deficit. Their narrative has already been assumed for them. So there's no black variation or black brown variation. And then I would also say institutional racism shows up when, when we say, okay, I'm getting better, we're getting, get, we're getting better, we're getting better. Um, award programs, do, most award programs do not look at growth. They look at what quote unquote consistency. So how do you fight against the person who out the gate had the 4.0 because they were learning the same thing they learned in their boarding school versus the, the, the student who maybe came from whatever circumstance, start with a 2.5, but learn the material, made their way to a Dean's list, but somehow because of how GPA calculation work still barely manages a 3.0, doesn't qualify for the Watson, Fulbright might be out of their reach if the school doesn't want to nominate them, right? Because the arc is not being paid attention to. And you know what we tell those students? Oh, just write a meaningful story. But then we train those students to only tell their trauma stories. I'll tell them that, you know, you came from this, 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 and this. And that could be part of their story, but it's not their only story. And so institutional racism to me is institutions that rely on black and brown bodies to relive trauma to um, build um, to build their deficit with themselves and their community, and also to just keep promoting this notion that there's no cultural knowledge that comes in. Like sometimes y'all frame the questions poorly. Um, John Dewey, um, his found, which is one of the major educational philosophers that higher ed is founded on, says that higher ed institutions are institutions that mirror the home. I'm sorry, Vassar College, Poughkeepsie, even my previous institutions does not mar mirror the Bronx, right? And so we also have to think about these notions of, of, um, of ways people even get filtered into these institutions and, and how that might be part of institutional racism. But I can go on because <laughs> I, I see it everywhere. Listen. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> right. I'm telling you, like, just to go off of Atia. My thesis was on how um, demographic questions in college applications, it was whether they hurt or help students, but most importantly, students of color. And, you know, what I found was if you were of, you know, Asian persuasion, where you're from the Eastern Hemisphere, was giving you a boost and it was allowing more students of Asian background to enter into uh, college programs, but most importantly, the Big Ten schools. And, but not only that, you know, when you're looking at your, your state schools and they're looking for specific uh, grades, specific GPAs, things of that nature, they weren't necessarily looking at that as a whole, they were looking for more students who came from specific ethnic backgrounds in order to acquire, you know, a certain number in any specific uh, ethnicity in order to fit like their diversity goals. And we're, we're, we were seeing that most with the Big Ten schools, but you're still seeing those with state schools. And the, the biggest thing when you're coming to that is if I'm dealing with students that are coming from an area where they haven't had an opportunity to get the the training that they needed as far as their math courses as far as their their communications courses and then they're going through the application process where they may not meet the the specific grade levels or the gpa levels and then they're having to write essays in order to be entered into their college programs they're, they're, not, they're not being able to successfully write those essays either. So if they're not doing that and they're not taking the SATs or the ACT, it's, it's really putting them at a disadvantage. And, the, and because of the, the K through 12 programming and the way these classes are set up, because they're missing those initial, like very, very important educational pieces, they're not even getting a chance to enter into the, the state college or university that they're looking to go to. And it's, it's already shutting the door in their face. And a lot of students, you know, I definitely encourage students to take the route of going to community college first, but there are some students 
that don't want to go that route because they feel like, you know, it's going to be like a dead end for them. And they feel like, hey, if I don't get out of, you know, this specific area, I I'm going to get stuck here. And they, and they don't want to do that. And because they're not taking those, you know, courses where they're getting that training that they didn't get in high school, if it's not offered at their school, they're really just being left out there and they think that there's not an option for them. And that that's really where that systemic racism comes in because it's, it's giving people a stop before they even get started and they're getting discouraged and they're not trying to find additional options or there's no one there to, to let them know that there are other options for them. Um, well, <laughs> okay, that's like, that's a lot to, to, um, to um, unpack. And um, that's just from one question. Um, it's difficult to even hear this. And I've been studying education for like a couple years now. And it's even difficult to hear it because I feel like black and brown students have just not been receiving things that they probably should have and they deserve so much more. So it, it, I take it on a, it hits me personally because I teach black and brown students as well in higher education. And when they get to me during their first year of school, I see a lot of things that I'm like, what happened in the past like 10 years that you've been in school, what happened? Because when they get to me, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of crucial things that they need as far as like basic, basic essay writing and conversation. And um, a lot of the things that you all said, there's a lack of funding, there's um, resources from the higher ends that when it trickles down to us, then we have to kind of redo it all over again because the people in those high spaces don't care about the people that's gonna be teaching them and vice versa. So um, definitely hitting on some really great points there. Um, it's just amazing. Um, for anybody that is just coming on, if you have questions, definitely put them in the Q&A and we can ask them a little bit later. Um, I am gonna move on to the next question that I have for you all that I wanted to ask. And it's, kinda, it's gonna be kind of a blended question a little bit. Um, do you all think that standardized testing is the most effective way to judge a black and brown learner? Um, I did a study about this during my master's course and I feel like only me and my professor were like here. Everybody else was like, well, standardized testing, how else are you gonna judge the students? But when I looked at how standardized testing really works against black and brown students, I was like, oh. <laughs> it's like my mouth dropped and I was kind of like, wait a minute. Um, and my professor was like, yes, you know, she was agreeing with me. But since I have a bunch of ed educators here, people who work closely with black and brown students, I would like to ask that question. Um, very briefly, and then I want to move on to the next one. But I wanted to ask you all that while you were here. Oh, Jay, I, are you talking? Do you want to? Oh, you're thinking. I'm thinking to myself. <laughs> this is like it, it kind of goes goes hands in hand, hand in hand, right? You're, you're you're getting people to take this standard test, but everybody doesn't have the standard um, the standard resources, the standard educators right we talked about teach for teach for america people um who don't have any background in teaching saying hey go teach right um uh, i was able to as, as fortunate as i was to have the opportunity and even though i consider myself you know one of the ones who you know took the opportunity and ran with it yeah yeah i taught in i i was in grad school while teaching first year right and the fact that i was able to do that as appreciative as i am i feel like i shouldn't have been able to do that except i needed to eat so i was like i need to figure this out you know what i mean like um, so like the standardized test for and the, the the students are not getting it's not it's not equal and we're asking them to be tested as if it was as if it were equal. So I do not think it's it, it, it works that way. It's not a one size fits all, but we're we're te we're testing them as if it is. Um, I'll say that the history of standardized testing is actually rooted in eugenics um, and trying to um, have some false scientific proof of, of who knows who's smarter and, and not. Um, I think to answer to answer the question, I don't think that I don't think that standardized testing is ineffective for just black and brown kids. I think standardized testing is ineffective as a measure of learning for all kids. And I I I put my I put my what I will always what I will also say though is that coming from a subject that if we look at what has transpired in our nation, um, I think 
um, I've always thought this, but I think social studies is one of the most important subjects to ever be taught in school um, because anybody that does not know their history is doomed to repeat it. And we can't, we just cannot get out of a cycle of ignorance and um, uh, you know, willful ignorance because we don't want to teach the actual truth about who actually built this country. And, you know, so I, I love um, and I, I taught in New York and I actually did have, you know, some of the, well, one of the highest passing rates in the network that I taught at when I taught high school for the U.S. history regions. And I told my, <laughs> thank you. And I told my students that, look, I think, you know, as a, as a, as a person who is here, who is living here, who pays taxes, who, you know, they, co they collect the money out your check. You need to know a lot of this stuff. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to act like you shouldn't know it. So I'm not going to sit here and, and cape behind. Oh, I don't agree with this. No, we got to do this. They finna evaluate me. You finna get evaluated by this test and you finna pull up. Okay. And so that's what we, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get there and we're going to get there and it's going to be hard. And yes, I'm a little crazy, but you will thank me when you see the limits of what you can do when you push yourself. Now, in terms of like overall standardized testing, I think it's outdated. I think it's outmoded. I believe more in project-based learning. I believe more in, um, I'm an advocate for experiential learning. I know um, Atia, you brought up John Dewey. I'm a Dewey disciple in that way um, because you learn so much more when students produce and create things and you give them so much more room to speak to what they know in a way that is more um, generous um, and more, um, and more inclusive to the different ways that our kids learn and the different ways that our kids process information. So it's very biased to say everybody has to write something. It's very biased to say everyone has to sit down in a certain amount of time and figure this out. And it's not the truth. That's not how anyone works. In the world of work, you still have some time to process what people ask you to do. So I don't understand how we're doing these tests. But it's a money-making machine, and it's a scheme, and that's why they're still trying to get people to take tests, even though we remote. It's about that bag for them. So I'm clear about that. <laughs> and, and I just want to say something about standardized testing, right? If it was a true standardized test, it would be universal across all 50 states. We would have some sort of like universal training about it, right? I'm a product of New York City region, okay? Before they did the whole reconfiguration of the math, listening to an essay be read twice and then saying write an essay and then do that two or three times. If you, if you have any auto um, differences, if you are a slow writer for notes, and you know, we'd say, we're gonna train you for the test, right? And so there's no, to me, there's no such thing as a standard test. It's just an accept, it's like, there's measurements that we say we all like, individually, statewide, citywide, you know, come to do. But I tell people that like, I don't believe in standardized testing. I believe I'm all about what doctor just said of just being like, no experiential and stuff. But I was like, it's not really a standardized test. And let me say something about when I have not worked in um, college admissions, but I, you know, I'm in higher ed. I study all different um, functional areas. When they submit the, the transcript to higher ed, it comes with a profile of the school. So you know what courses the school offered in relation to the student's profile, right? And so my school had AP classes and I'm competing against people who didn't have AP classes. My standardized scores of New York City regions grades widely different than uh, the Florida state school tests, right? And you just need trained admission officers who can read between the difference in the standardized tests. But I can tell you right now, me learn, knowing where the mitochondria is, like is, that should not make or break if I should go to college or technical school or all these other things. Um, and standardized testing then being used as a funding measure further marginalizes folks, right? And so New York City, I'm not sure if they still do it, but when I was in high school, I graduated high school in 2010. Um, uh, if you got advanced regions diploma with distinction, you got additional money if you went to a state school. And I took all, I, I was one point short and I took my regents over and I got that one point and then I went out of state. <laughs> I was like, bye, I'm not, I'm not staying in state. But it was one of those moments of like, I, but once again, I had the, the type of like family structure and, and home where I had Wi-Fi and all that other stuff at my house. That's not, that was not the normalized experience of anyone in my class. And I went to a public magnet school where it started off as a magnet then went public, right? And so, yeah, it's, it's so this this notion of standardized testing doesn't function. And we and I see when we see it with the missions because that's why you need the individual profile. So this right. so 
I'm just echoing everything that doctor already said. And it's, 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 a, it's a false, it's, it's a sense of um, saying we can measure ourselves to something. And I will also say, um, people are trying to use, uh, one of the, the uses of standardized tests is compare ourselves to the global space. But once again, like testing structure is different, school hours are, just, uh, are different, opportunities are different. Like, why do we keep using this idea of standardized testing? I will never know. Mm. Right, and I'm I'll jump sure. in too. Oh yeah, go go ahead. Darlene. Um, so I both agree and disagree with standardized tests only because I do believe that it is beneficial for um, you know, schools, students, um, everyone, but also um, like someone mentioned before, the one size fits all, um, does not work. It's you know, it doesn't work for the students. It doesn't work for the teachers. It and it doesn't work for school administration. Um, in my case personally, as an ESL student. I had to work um, twice as hard just to pass, you know, these state tests because it's like I I already don't have the, you know, English language um, skills. And it's like I had to make up for that um, in these tests. And then on top of learning everything else that everyone else, all the other students are learning, it was so much more difficult. Um, so the test, yeah, it's it's good only for certain purposes, but as far as you know, everyone having to take them, and you know, you have to take this in order to attend, um, in order to get accepted into university. I don't think that's fair. Um, but yeah, so I both agree and disagree with it. Yeah, I I'm just gonna jump in. I know I'm not. A, I know I'm not a panelist, but I'm just gonna jump in there after what Darlene just said real quickly because I do believe that standardized testing can be used, like you said, in certain factors. So like, if I'm in a program and we've all taken the same courses, we you know we're in the same thing, we're in the same field, and you have a test geared towards that field. Okay, yeah, I can see some okay. type of test, you know, being given to students to like kind of measure out, you know. I'm not trying to have a doctor that fails their tests, you know, like, it's like okay, you know, so I think, right, exactly, Isaiah, so like, something mm -hmm. like that, and even I was talking to, like, we have some friends in England, it's like, we don't take tests that's outside of what we're trying to go to school for, mm. that's, you know, so if I'm, I'm not at the greatest at science, but I have to pass that part because then the university is going to be like oh you failed really low in science I don't know if you're well-rounded enough it's like yeah but I'm going to school for English like I know the basics you know of science but I'm not going into biology so now I'm I'm so now I'm up against somebody that just so happened to do really well in science. like so excuse me there's a lot of moving parts in that. so I do agree with that where it's like you know <laughs> some things is good some things is really not that great but I did want to ask that because there was always a lot of debates especially when the pandemic hit they're like hold on do we stop testing or do we keep going and a lot of people were like no you don't we don't this is not the time to test students when they're isolated in their homes and away from society and their friends and everyday life and they're like 12 you know that's not really okay so um I, I thought that was really interesting and especially when you have um certain groups of people like you know uh black brown students students of color may have certain factors that play against them already and then you add on something like standard testing so i wanted to ask that real quick um hello um well the last panelist just hopped in so we're gonna speak to you in a minute um so i'm gonna move on real quickly um because i i am looking at the time so we're doing good um i do want to know how does your teaching philosophy um play into how education is being ran today as far as the pandemic goes because there's a lot of teachers who are burnt out there's a lot of educators who are burnt out there's a lot of students who are tired and it's i feel like voices are not being heard i feel like we're, we'll be in spaces like this or amongst our other educator friends, but then when we try to go outside of these walls, our voices kind of hit a wall and then it doesn't get anywhere. And it's very frustrating to like be heard. Um, so your teaching philosophy, what is that? And then also how does that play in how education is being ran today? Does it match up? Are you, what are your frustrations that are kind of being hit? Um, and looking at the time a little bit, so just be like real briefly. But um, that's the next question. And I see Isaiah had its. Um, yeah, I'll um, comment. Um, they, um, 
my philosophy in a nutshell is meet them where they are um, during any normal year. Differentiation is the buzzword that they, they, they made us use, right? So differentiate all the time. Um, and especially during a pandemic, you don't know what's going on at home. You don't know um, how this, what's going on outside of the home and their communities, how the parents are affecting, um, are being affected as well. Their families that are distant. A lot of people have uh, families across the country. We don't know. And the frustration that's coming with me this year is that everybody's so quick to acknowledge that we're in a pandemic. This is a different year. Things aren't gonna be the same. We have to be flexible. But then when it comes to the kids, why aren't they meeting this marker? Well, what's going on? Why aren't they doing this? We have to make sure that this is happening. Oh, they can't miss this because we have to get these minutes in. Where's the grace? You know, what, what happened to this being a, a different year? We're not meeting them where they are. Just like you said, they, they change every day. Their best today is not their best that is gonna be tomorrow or the best that is gonna be on Monday, um, which is tying it in a, in a little bit, which is why standardized testing to me is so frustrating because it's that one snapshot that you're getting that makes a break. But my philosophy again is meet them where they're at and that, that where they're at is gonna be different every day to keep it short. I agree with you, Isaiah. I mean, I feel like mine just is pretty much the same or, or along the same lines because I just like to coach coach people to their strengths. And that was something that I learned in like my corporate training in being a, a manager and, and coaching my my team to their strengths. And I think it's the same thing goes to my students and being an instructor of people who are in distance learning, but starting school after not having been in school for 10, 15, 20 years or going from a traditional setting. And then now, oh, I got to go online. I'm not used to being on the computer. I think, you know, coaching people to their strengths and just giving them an opportunity to say, hey, this is, this is where I excel. This is where I need help. And then I allow my students to, you know, kind of choose if they see someone in their classroom that is really good in a certain area, but they know that that is an area of opportunity for them. Like, hey, pair up. If you're if you're okay with helping this student, go ahead and do that. But if you are someone that you know is better off working by themselves, but you need additional help, like reach out to me. And I feel like because I teach students who are adults and they're you know they're working full time, they're full time parents. I, I I see other instructors that are not as flexible. And being a student of this, like I did my, my entire undergrad, well, most of my undergrad online. And I've run into instructors who are just not flexible and are like, hey, you signed up for this program, you got to do it. And realistically, life happens. And I think a lot of my philosophy as of right now is to understand that just like I experience, you know, things that pop up in my life, so do my students, and just trying to be flexible. Because when you when you allow them to come to you and just say, hey, I'm having these issues. I'm trying to get this done. Can I get some grace? Can I get an extra day or two? Can I just, you know, get some help? They're, they are more communicative and they don't disappear. You get students disappearing when they feel like, hey, if I go to you, you're just going to slam the book at me and, and turn around and go away. You know what I'm saying? So just trying to be flexible and coach people to their strengths and pair people up if possible so that those areas of opportunity are being filled and vice versa. Um, so I was gonna just share that. I think the response, I, I'm not in the classroom anymore and I kind of thank God that I'm not because I think it, it is a testament to, um, I, think, I, think a lot of, I think a lot of the world has seen just the disregard for teachers that exists and a lot of the systemic kind of uh, the systemic approaches that make education in this country just terrible. Um, I think I've, for me, what, I, what I've seen is I've seen such an egregious um, response from leadership. I don't understand how it is. A, and, and a lot of what teachers do is directed from the top. It's a top down approach. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a bilateral agreement, it's not a conversation. Um, and to have, a, to have this time period be something like what it is and there isn't like a, a reconsideration of how are we evaluating people are we evaluating are we evaluating teachers are we doing 
class visits, like the whole model of, of just taking what happened in the building and moving it to a computer doesn't actually work. Um, and the considerations that needed to be had in this, as for, the, for, for all the people that are leaders getting paid all of this money, I don't know how, why a lot of leadership has just been exposed. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And teachers are left to <laughs> have to pick up the slack. I know a lot of teachers who are working more now remotely than when they were in person. And that's not fair. It's not fair that, you know, I'm a mom. And so, you know, here he is. I have to go pick him up because he was fussing, but you know, it's not fair that there are teachers who are parents, there are teachers who are teaching, parents, tutoring, doing all of these things for the sake of just checking boxes. And I and I just think I, I wasn't hopeful about um, the system changing, but I'm even more pessimistic about it now because so many people have just refused to acknowledge the very real ways that this could have gone differently and this could have looked differently. So... You know, and I think to the extent that you can, you know, all of us are going to afford our kids grace because we come from backgrounds that that's what we need. And we're empathetic people who show up for our kids showing up in empathy because that's who we are. But so many people, you know, don't have that compass. And so many people in front of our kids don't, you know, just don't care enough to think to think about that. And so that's what we're, we're just seeing all of this play out in this in this um, tornado of of just pandemic teaching so all right oh no i because I, I saw miss mcgrim you had your hands up yes, um, for I quite some time and up. i know i came no okay. go go right okay. ahead go right ahead well my teaching philosophy before the pandemic actually helped me with coping through the pandemic i'm consider myself a facilitator in the classroom so the student does the heavy lift um even when i was in secondary i really, really incorporated blended learning in my classroom. So that meant the student did the readings and the videos and the things before classes. So to add to their knowledge. So when they came into class, we could have that discourse. We could create those projects to show that they understood. So when the pandemic happened, it kind of made that even more possible. And so like one of the things we're doing now is that Apple diversity project that they have going on where the students have to take what they know about history and, and social justice and create a community project that they can use today. So I like to create opportunities for them to bridge what's going on in the world because you can't ignore it. Even though I teach history, ignoring it is not gonna make it go away. So I think they find comfort in being able to use their emotions into what was going on, but also use the knowledge. And that's how I use my teaching philosophy to get them buy into that project, to get them to buy in into the content, but also to reach them where they are culturally, emotionally, and so that they can thrive. Yes, and I, I'm, I'm, yes, naps all around for that, absolutely. Um, I am just gonna like briefly just jump in here because um, time is slipping away from us. I'm like, wait a minute. Um, but I definitely agree um, with that. That is show students a little bit more grace and I don't know, who else is watching um, the participants who is watching definitely show your students and your kids grace during this time. It is not easy. I don't even know how students are doing it because if I had to sit in front of a screen for hours after the world just shuts down out of the clear blue sky, I probably would have been in a fetal position in the corner. That's not even like an exaggeration. I don't know how they're doing it. I don't. Um, and then you look at students in higher education with that's already very stressful. And then you can't do the normal things that you can normally do to kind of de-stress yourself. Have grace on your students and your children that are learning in a pandemic. Because if it's hard on us, imagine it being hard on somebody that's just like, I'm, I'm literally just here to learn. That's all, that's the only reason why they're here. And now you add on all these other things. So just kind of echoing what everybody said. And I, um, I just wanted to echo what you said, Kavina, just by saying that a lot of people miss socialization. Yeah. Like, being, seeing people like they fr friends network you know communicating it's it's a mental health every day every single person working remotely is a, is one day away from a mental health crisis and that's what we just have to name that because it's hard this is not normal to be home all the time right and uh and it, it's true it's true um, I'm, I'm sorry
No, it's, <laughs> I was trying, I was going to go to the, the next, the next question. Anything that you all have to say, definitely type it in the chat too. Just be, you know, type it up, type it up. Um, cause there's something else I wanted to ask real quickly. And we did have a few questions, um, from participants. Um, I would really like to understand what is your definition of anti-racism lessons? Because I feel like that's become a new word, just like equity has become a new word. Um, and not many people know what it is. So they'll use it and say it. And it's like, okay, do you really know what it means? So very like a couple of sentences, very briefly, what is your definition of anti-racism lessons? I can give a example. I think anti-racism lessons, they're not preachy. You allow the person to see, oh, that's a whole different perspective. So you don't give them the perspective, you allow the discourse in the classroom so that the perspective can develop and grow from the current state. And I think that's what an anti-racism lesson is supposed to do. You don't tell them what to think, you allow them to get there. Anybody else? <laughs> I think anti-racism is is an it's like a knee jerk reaction because what I think has been like just listening to um to Bakita say like how she does her classroom and I'm like that's how I was doing my classroom you know like I think for the for us that have been doing the work the real the real language is culturally responsive pedagogy it is understanding that and accepting that that there are different cultures in your room and that all those cultures and those, those nuances and those experiences have value in your room. It's not centered in me as the teacher, as the authority, because I like to facilitate as well. And I don't know everything. And I flex that I don't know muscle in front of my students very often. If I don't know something, why don't you go look it up and then come tell me what you find? Cause I don't know, I just don't know. And I don't want to tell you wrong information. Um, so it's decentralizing, um, you know, it's decentralizing whiteness and it's giving it's giving weight and credence to cultures that are outside of the narrative that we know to expect and that have long been standing in the in the classroom and letting students be exposed to that. Yes, and thank you. I know that you have your you're taking mom, she's in mom and educator mode. Like I go ahead. So it's a it's all right. Um um I'm gonna go in order because I'm trying to move kind of like a little bit more of a flow so um a t i see you next and then isaiah i saw you on mute and then um dr nail j uh darlene and christina i want to hear more from you all so i'm trying to i'm trying to pin back and forth a little mm -hmm. bit so a t you go in and isaiah you can go next yeah i was just gonna echo um that anti-racism um one yes to everything with the culture resp um, responsive pedagogy but it's, and to me it's also naming race as as both uh so like both but the structural that's why the racism is part of it right some people use the term racism to mean broadly any oppression but the way it's being used recently is to mean really race-based as it is in the u.s because we know that race as it plays out on a global scale looks so radically different that sometimes we can't apply it so that's why i love the cultural responsiveness it means also resetting history to make sure that a historical narratives don't um, and dominant narratives majority of narratives don't stay place so um jay um shared at the beginning when we were circulating of just like making sure those counter narratives are there those testimonials and making sure that students know your existence is a counter story right those black and brown students because once again, not only you're in the classroom, but you're making change and you don't have to be listed in a textbook. You don't have to be phrased, but you are your existence, right? And you can, and you don't have to um, view everything and write everything through the white gaze, right? Um, and so when I hear anti-racism, a lot of my pedagogy is also on focusing on narrative of like, what narrative um, do you have to spend time on? What narratives have you received? And what, what is your cycle of socialization is one of my favorite. What is your, your I can use constructivism. I can use all these meaning making, all these fancy words. But at the end of the day, how did you come to know what you know? Unpack that because all of that is, is in um, dominance weighing down on you, right? So anti-racism practices that. And, the, and I, depending, because, you know, Kendi and everyone else is big right now, I will connect it to prisms and cultural state and um, Black bodies as a, like, being versus like 
philosophical blackness, right? Um, but I, at the end of the day, I told them, I said, what, what, what practice can I give you that's liberatory, that is healing? Because if we're gonna talk about anti-racism, we also have to talk about um, trauma healing. And, and a lot of people don't wanna talk about trauma healing because sometimes they don't see themselves as ever executing the trauma or they don't see it, see it present. And so my work has also been thinking about not just trying to educate you or reveal your story, but there's a lot to it generationally too that, right. that you may not get to, but yeah. Right. I, um, Isaiah, if you know, you want to chime in uh, real quick? Real quick, yes. Yeah. So um, like she brought up Ibram and I'm reading his definition of anti-racist, one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or expressing an anti-racist idea. And I want to tie that into what Dr. Ann said about, I'm not, I'm not going to have this whole sit my students down and say, this is what, this doesn't, you're going to be anti-racist right now. It's about practice, anti-racist practice, anti-racist pedagogy, anti-racist policy that you have in your classroom. So instead of, I, I'm fortunate enough to teach um, music, right? Everybody listens to music, regardless of what culture you are a part of. We had a project where everybody was making a playlist that reflected different parts of their life. And then they presented it in front of the classroom. Um, and if we had cultures from every, I work in the uh, most diverse district in Middlesex County. So we are, um, I'm seeing so many different types of music. And that's as simple as saying, oh, I learned about that. That's really cool. What do y'all like, right in the chat, what y'all like about this, this song? Or we don't understand the words. Oh, do you understand this? What are they talking about? Giving the kid a, a chance to express his, um, express his culture and just showing that it's accepted. So even though that people might say that's small, but racism was taught in very narrow ways. Yes, it's out in the absurd too, but it was something that was just practiced by action. They saw how we treated them. They learned it that way. They saw how we treated that person and what we said. And then that's how it was taught. So you can break it down the same way. These little steps that people don't think matter. It is very important. Right. And it's something that everyone has kind of just touched upon is different perspectives. That's the whole point point really especially in America where there's no one race there's no one you know person uh, that's why I love the beauty of it but they always some you always see the negative sides of it and it's really a beautiful thing to have a classroom full of all different types of people in different cultures but we often are glossed over them we overlook you know the um those races and cultures and backgrounds. So it's important to understand what anti-racism really means is that you have an open mind with you and your students and you tell them we are going to try to open up our minds, our hearts, you know, and we're going to try to look at this in a different way. Um, so I, I definitely agree with um, that. And Isaiah, if you don't mind, could you drop that definition in there? And if not many people know who that author is, absolutely amazing, you know, um, He's not new, but he seems to be new. Um, and um, yes, there's the book right there. I know I have my book over there on the side. Absolutely amazing. A few, a few of his books are really uh, amazing. Um, and you know, thank and thank you for putting that in there. And also the author's name. Um, okay. I wanted this to chime in. Oh. oh, darling, go ahead. Go ahead. I was Sorry. gonna say I wanted to chime in and also discuss anti-racism. I feel that um. It all goes back to curriculum and also someone mentioned narratives. Um, just like the things we're learning in the classroom. I remember back in high school, my favorite subject was history. And I loved going to history class every day and just learning about so many different cultures. But it was just like, that was the only place I was learning it. I wasn't reading, you know, different authors in my English classroom. I wasn't reading books about different authors. Um, I wasn't learning any of that besides history I learned all of about all these people but never in like an English class or any other classes so I think it's going back to um, curriculum what we're allowing our students to learn in the classroom and it's just we have to be more diverse and more broad when it comes to curriculum because in my district I didn't um, read any African-American narratives until college and I was just like oh my goodness like how come I didn't read any of this like all of this is so good I learned um, you know different books from different authors when I got to college but as far as um, curriculum in high school it was just you know you learn about the history of you know America and that's it you don't learn anything else about diversity um, unless you go out and read things on your own of course um but yeah anti-racism it definitely starts there with 
curriculum and allowing students to read more diverse contexts. Yeah, and it's and it's interesting that you even say that that it wasn't until you got to college because that that has been a few polls that I've been seeing around on social media. Like, when was the black black teacher you had? My masters. <laughs> like, it's just like you know stuff like that. So um, that plays a part in it as well as where you are and like where you grew up and everybody has their own story about it. Um, that would be actually interesting to find out everybody who's watching or who's actually on. When was your first uh, black or brown teacher that you had? It's actually very interesting. Um, I am moving on to the next uh, thing real quick. Um, and this, these are the last two questions that I have. And then there is a question in the chat that somebody wants to ask the panelists. Um, I want to know, um, well, I guess, you know, you you can briefly explain this, but explain critical pedagogy approaches educators need to know when having Black African American students in their classrooms. Very, very brief. Go. <laughs> can you repeat that? Is yes. And you know what? I can't even like kind of put this in the chat as well, but explain critical pedagogy approaches educators need to know when having Black or African American students in their classrooms. I think um, teachers need to consider the parenting at home, the parenting styles at home. And that's a, something that I'm actually looking into how parenting styles with teachers play into the classroom pedagogy. Because I had to tell my son's math teacher, do not insinuate to my son. He thinks that's an option. You have to give him a directive and then he'll do it. <laughs> so I think sometimes with our students, they don't know that you can't say, well, little Johnny, how do you feel today? Do you feel like doing your work? Because he's like, no, I want to sit here and listen to my music. So you have to tell him, little Johnny, we're going to do our work for 15 minutes and then I'll give you a, a brain break. That You don't have to be a dictator, but you have to be direct with our students. I'll piggyback shortly and say that Critical, so critical pedagogy is something that acknowledges that, um, as like in terms of a framework, it acknowledges that institutional racism exists in almost every single facet of, of the life that we live. And so just speaking to your point, Bakita, um, which is very true, um, most of education and the way that we think about many things, parental involvement, um, classroom management, um, you know, just values around how we look at parents and how we look at our students is rooted in upper middle class white norms. And so you and so any teacher that is looking to be anti racist, any teacher that is that is looking to be um, more equitable in how they and how they teach black and brown students needs to acknowledge and accept that reality first above everything else because nothing everything if you look at the uniform i used to be like i don't i don't do uniform checks in my room because this is this is this is irrelevant to what i'm trying to do i'm trying to teach my kids if they're here i don't care if their hoodie is on if they're here i don't care if their sneakers are black or blue or, that's not my business that's not my business my business is their brain okay and what we trying to do and a lot of these policies around you know discipline um what they wear you know, their hair, like a lot of these things that even us as black teachers have to enforce, you have to take a stand and say, mm, that's not actually related to the learning. And so that is something that I'm not gonna, I'm not really gonna focus on that, even though it's a mandate for you all in your systems, these systems are racist and these systems are trying to police our kids. So the, the, the directive thing, that is a cultural thing I've always noticed. We, we teach and talk to our kids very differently. And when we come into the space as black teachers and try to do that, we are, I was often reprimanded for my tone by, you know, white propping, you know, administrators. And I'm like, well, it's okay because they do when I, when I ask them to do stuff, they do it. And we have an understanding. And if they don't have a problem with it, they can come and tell me because that's the culture in my room. And so we just, so critical pedagogy infuses everything just by acknowledging that the institutions themselves are racist and so we kind of have to side eye a lot of the things that we do systemically to to kind of keep that going in the way that we operate and in the way that we interact with our students and so I think that's that's kind of like how we can kind of question it at first and 
And to piggyback off of that, I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's remembering, especially when, you know, teaching uh, students, of co students of color, more specifically, you know, black and brown students, even more specifically black students, um, that just because I'm teaching black students or I taught black students before or I have another black student or another black classroom coming in later, I can't teach them the same way. I can't even teach them the same way within different classes myself. With even more, I can't teach them the same way you teach them. You can have that tone with them. That doesn't mean I can. Right. It worked. It doesn't work for them. No, you have that relationship. You have that bond. You decide you have that contract with each other. And that's how you, you teach them. And I have to find my way with those students and then the next class and the next class and then another group of kids the next year. Right. So I think um, it's it re remind remind you have to remind ourselves or remind teachers coming in that, you know, it's not you, know, you can't be the teacher of black students. You're a teacher who teaches black students and their students, their children, their kids. You have to learn them every time. It's your job to learn how they learn, how they respond, to learn, learn about their parents, how their parents want to be, um, you know, reached out to, whether they do want to be reached out to, whether they want to know a lot of information, whether they don't talk, don't talk to me unless it's something bad, don't talk to me unless it's something good. Like it's your job to learn all of that. Um, and remember that just because you're teaching um, you know, black kids doesn't mean you know how to teach black kids because next year we are completely different. Next month, it might be completely different. Tomorrow, it could be completely different. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, one of the, the, the key things that I think has been mentioned um, during this whole session is um, by Isaiah. And he mentioned, you have to meet the students where they are. So I, I've been teaching for seemingly a million years at, at some point, And I had to check myself because I had a standard teaching style. And I'm going, this isn't working. What happened in 2000 X, I can't use in two, you know, 2021 at this point. So, you know, I, I've become Auntie Dawn at school because um, Dr. Ann, I, I had that, that same mentality, you know, I'm like this, but the students respect it. You know, you know what I'm saying? So um, I, I totally agree that we have to have a different, a different style and a different approach to the way that we, um, that we work with students. And it's not always going to be the same. You can adjust, it'll be cohort to cohort. It could be classroom to classroom. It can be student to student. I, one, one story that I have, um, I have a summer bridge program and uh, some of these students um, we're coming in on the lower end of the of the GPA scale, so to speak. Um, so they needed a little extra a little extra help, and I enlisted the help of um, one of my colleagues. And this one specific student who um, was he was from my hometown and um, from a less desirable quote unquote area, so to speak, um, by this teacher's standards. So she reminded he the student reminded him her of someone that um, her husband who was a cop had picked up. So she stereotyped this student and she, she figured that this student needed to be taught and needed to be talked to a certain way. And they, every day, every day. And it was her bias. It was her bias that would not allow her to get through to this student. And consequently, he wasn't having it. He wasn't having it at all. So I actually had to go in and have a come to Jesus, quote unquote, with, with this professor and tell her, this is not how we do. This is not how we do this at all. This student deserves the same respect as this student that's sitting on this side or on that side. So I, I totally understand you have your bias. I totally understand that you have your perceptions, but we can't have this. We can't have this at all. So y'all are absolutely right. I, I love the, the part that you have to meet the students where, where they are. And in order for us to continue to be effective as educators, we're gonna have to continue in that same vein. Yes, and just real, oh, I'm like, did, wait, did someone have to unmute? Oh, I was, but go ahead, you're good. No, I was, I was, I'm, I'm brief, I'm, cause I'm looking at the time, I'm like, oh, this is such a great conversation. Oh my gosh, it's going to the time. Where, where did the time go? Why does time go by fast when you're having a good conversation, but slow, like during the day, what's going on? So, <laughs> um, just very, very briefly, something, um, I, I, and I'm, I'm listening and I'm trying to think back. I think it was Isaiah. Um, I have to remember, but no, 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 Jay, you have said it. Having a relationship a relationship with your student. That's it. That's really what it comes down to, really. And something that on um, one of, I have actually um, uh, brilliant 
uh, panelists from last week actually chimed in and put it in the chat, creating a space for students to speak and think freely and embrace other cultures. That right there is something that is not talked about enough. And it's something that I try to do in my classroom, but I feel as if if somebody was sitting in my classroom, they'll think I'm doing injustice because I'm just an English composition teacher. You're not supposed to be doing that in your classrooms. No, I need to know who I'm teaching. Otherwise we're always gonna butt heads and I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to get through certain things. I need to know if you speak Spanish and that's your first language, I need to know that. Then how can I incorporate that into my lesson? So what I did was I put up something with Spanish speaking in there so that they can feel comfortable. Like, you know what, Professor B? That was real cool of you. That's the first time I've ever felt comfortable in a classroom. This kid's like, like 19, 20 years old. You know, this is the first time you felt comfortable in the classroom, why? It's a relationship that I, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna happen with every single student that sits in my classroom, but it's, I'm gonna try. That's the point of me being there. They're here to learn from me, not, you know, not for me to just kind of be like, oh, I'm, I'm big and bad because I'm sitting here in the front of the classroom. No, it's about learning each other's cultures and having students being able to think and be free of whatever they're learning about in the classroom. I have to say that, but I'll brush up on that. Very quickly. Uh, uh, go ahead. <laughs> can I add two? Two. So I want to also add, you can't do that if you're afraid of your black and brown students, well, right? Because of your own racism and your bias, right? Because mm -hmm. I I grew up in New York City, where the threat was if you don't behave, you get kicked out of class, so you miss lessons, right? What does it mean if someone is quote unquote acting up to sit with them, right? And, and here's the thing, I know the classrooms are 35 to 40 something people maybe more. So I'm not going to say like it's the easiest job in the world because I, ha I have not been in the K-12 system that like that. I remember constantly, specifically Black and Latinx boys, not men, boys being said, if you don't behave, you're going to go to Rikers Island, right? And and yes, it was very common to say, oh, you're gonna, this person's going to go to Rikers Island. Oh, I had an uncle go to Rikers Island. It was so common to threaten that. And it was from both white professors, um, teachers and um, teachers of color. Right. And so for me, when we're talking about relationships, you have to unpack all the shit you learned about black and brown people, because one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm writing when I eventually do my dissertation in like five plus years um, is the adultification process that black and brown people, uh, uh, children go through. So if you're threatened at them for being where they're at developmentally of, of hormonal or just frustrated or didn't eat that day and then suddenly having a tamper because tam you know because of their headache right so we can say i'm saying yes relationships and also i'm gonna ask you and i don't know what the racial demographics of the uh the the attendees are because we all need to do work myself included even being a black body because once i like i said even the black teachers did that even the teachers of color threatened rikers right if you're afraid of your your students you can you will never make a true relationship you will always be this distance of let me handle you right. and then pass you on. Right. And so I just wanted to add that part because um, being from the inner city, that fear mongering and, and I grew up with the time with Maury and Jerry and all these, these fear <laughs> things of stay in line because the minute you stay in line, you'll be in the carceral state. Right. right. Um, and, and I'm just thinking about that with black lives matter and how, like when students are protesting, when they're leaving, when they're leading these charges, our bodies are still on the line and they come back to the classroom when the teacher is like, well, if you act up, I'm gonna call security. That sure. was my reality growing up. And luckily I'm, you know, I'm twice college educated, but not a not, that's not, I'm the abnormal of my community, right? A lot of resources went into me. A lot of resources went into me. And so I just wanted to say that because I wanna emphasize build relationships. And also if you have any moment where you've been afraid or you can't remember their age and you call them a man, or a woman, you need to check yourself. <laughs> you just need to check yourself. Yeah. Dr. Ann, you can say, you can go ahead uh, real briefly. <laughs> you go uh, ahead. Yeah, and I just wanted to piggyback off of what Atia was saying just by adding that in my own practice with my students, you know, this, I was very, um, I, I was very, I was militant, but I wasn't militant. I wasn't militant against them. I was militant about the need to want and to be hungry to learn and to understand that this system is designed for these very purposes. And they had to realize that. And I was very adamant about things like that. You know, I grew up in, in Flatbush. I went to the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a proud Quaker. Ivy graduated, master's, PhD from Fordham. I'm holding it down. 
And it was so important for me to be, to be vulnerable for my kids. When the day I bought my house, I said, look, y'all, this is the key to my house, okay? This is the key to my house. I, I saved up X amount of money. How much you think I make? I was doing it like this. You know, I taught them about, you know, I took a, a lesson about the Great Depression and turned it into teaching them about credit. And they were like, oh my God, DeRosier, like, I ain't even know, like, yo, so what you saying is, if I don't got it, don't charge it. And I said, right. I said, right. You know what I mean? So this, so... And I don't, and I don't think that anybody needs to talk the way that I talk or feel the way that I feel in order to relate to these kids. You know what I'm saying? As a teacher, you are a tutor. And anything that you, anything that you are going through, that's why um Kavina, when you were saying this is the English composition class, am I supposed to be? No, you have every right. And that's, and that's the point. The point is that as a, as a teacher, you have every right to bring your kids into your world to humanize yourself and to humanize them. They don't know. They don't know so many things. And right. so, and that's part of the anti-racist teaching too, is like telling them like, nah, this is, this system is like this so that, you know, you could fall into that trap. Don't do it. Right. Don't do it. Right. I was going to say the same thing as I asked for permission to speak. I promise. Yeah, yes, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing as Bakita said in the, in the, in the chat, like you have to be authentically you. I'll tell you right now, th three years ago, when I came into my new school, the students ate me alive. He does not know what, how it is to be in this school. He does not know our policies like that. He does not know our hand signals where they chewed me up and spit me out. So I was like, I was always on the defensive and I was trying to be militant and I was trying to be everything that I wasn't. Um, and for like two years straight, it was, it was, you know, uh, everything strict, sweat the small stuff. This is not, I would, I would come home. I'd hate myself. I'd hate my day. I'd hate, I'd, I'd uh, you know, complain to my, to my now fiance. Uh, and then January after, you know, the break, I would switch it up and I chalk it up to, oh, we've been together for four or five months. They know me. I could, I could kind of calm down a little bit. Then I started showing a little bit more of me, my, you know, my, my, my personality. Then by the time, uh, you know, March, March came in, they're doing project-based learning and running the classroom. I'm just chilling in the back. And I always chalked it up to, we've been together and that's why they can handle it. We've been together. So even before uh, the pandemic, I think the pandemic sped up the teacher that I wanted to be. Before the pandemic, like in February 2020, March, uh, January 2020, I said, I want to start the school year next year, this, this school year, you know, the teacher I want to be from day one. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If I act my, my goofy self, it doesn't work. Then I'll be like, you know what? It didn't work, but I tried, right? Um, so from day one, my students saw this, from day one, my students saw this goofy, loud, extra, this is how I'm teaching. I'm teaching like this and doing all this crazy stuff from day one, um, you know, uh, allowing grace because I, I myself ask for extensions and I tell my kids, ask for extensions. Sometimes I'll say yes. Most times I'll say yes. Sometimes I'll say no. And that has to be okay. Right. Uh, when it comes to projects, I say, you know, uh, I literally let them do a video. They could do, a, um, they could um, make a poster. They could do a slideshow, slideshow presentation. They could write a speech. They can do, they can show me, they understand the content in a different way. I just try my best to kind of speed up the way I, I would have wanted to, to, to learn. And I wanted to speed up who I wanted to be as a teacher. And because of the, of the pandemic, because of remote learning, I was able to do that. And I see that, oh, again, the whole authentic self that people try to like, you know, smack you with, it's true, right? Um, and you know what, guess what? Somebody else might not be able to teach the way I do, uh, like a clown, like a goofy person, because then, you know, they, they come in and the day they're tired, they're like this. I'm like, you can't do that if you're going to be teach like me. You have to wake up and be like, I'm tired, but we're going to do this and let's go. And this is my coffee. This is my third one today. Ha ha. And then, you know, they eat it up. Right. So be your authentic self. And then the students, you know, will follow. Right. And if you're not, if you are militant, be militant. If you, if you are, if you are a yeller, be, be a yeller and talk to them. Be like, yo, I'm a little loud today. Let me know if I'm too loud and go from there. If you're hyper like me, be hyper, do that thing. I have one teacher in my building who never, she's, she would talk to all her students like this the entire time. You guys good? All right. We're going to, and that's, and I would never be able to do that. Right. So the relationships come from being you. So you don't have to ever fight it. You don't have to ever pretend because you're just going to be like, we're going to do this today. Right. And this hyper self that I, I am right now, I am with my students, unless they go, Mrs. Salazar, not today. Then I'll be all right, you're right. And then right. we chill. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so interesting what Jay is saying. I do want to touch. First of all, the chat's going crazy. If y'all are looking at the chat, just look at the chat real quick. It's just pinging. Real quickly, what I want to say is that students know if you're genuine or not. They know they're not dumb. They're not, they know. 
So if you're trying to be something that you're not, they're going to know, which means they'll just pick on you more. Like, it's just like, you know, so I'm very nerdy teacher. Like, I'm cool after class, you know, I chill out. But then like during class, I'm, I'm extremely nerdy. And they're fine with it. They're like, oh, Professor B, like, that's so corny. I'm like, I know, but, you know, so that they, they, they like that. As long as you show your true self, they'll appreciate it because sometimes they're not allowed to be who they really are um, in the classrooms. And sometimes they're attacked for it. So definitely be your true self. Um, I am going to have two questions. We literally have about like seven minutes left. Um, we may go over like five minutes since we started like five minutes late. There was a question I have to go back up. Um, this is from a parent actually. Um, what things can I look for to ensure my children are receiving educational equity? Recommendations are welcome if that isn't measurable. Um, so that is something that was asked by a parent. Um, very, very briefly, if anybody wants to kind of touch up on that, I added the question in there for you all. Um, anything for a parent. Christina, I see that you, yes. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think the first thing is to talk to your kids about the, the classwork that they're doing and talk to them about their classmates and listen to them. And the one thing I put earlier is like a, a lot of people, not just kids, but people in general, like if you pay attention to specific things, you will pick up what they're not saying. Um, and I think having those type of conversations with your kids and just saying, hey, what is class like? What are, what are your classmates like? What are, does everybody seem to be doing the same thing? The, you know, what, what else are the other kids doing? Just to kind of see if everybody seems like they're on the same page. If it seems like a certain, you know, number of kids or kids in this area, they're not receiving the same type of feedback and, and hearing that from them first. And then once you go over that and you kind of, you know, break that down, then going back and, and potentially having the conversations with the teachers. Um, I think one of the biggest things for me is just making sure that, if, you know, my niece, if she's having an issue in the classroom and, you know, we haven't had that conversation with the teacher and just saying, hey, like, what, what can we do on our end? You know what I'm saying? So if you, if you do find that there is kind of a, a difference in the way that the teaching is going, you know, reaching out to the teachers. I know sometimes there are situations where the teachers just don't get it and they're, and they're, not, they're not helping the situation. But in a lot of cases, they're just not sure if the parents are, you know, willing to have that conversation with him, with them and, and do the work to make the environment more conducive to a better learning situation. Um, but having that conversation with them first and kind of hearing what they see and what they're picking up on, because if they don't feel like there's, you know, a difference in the way that they're being taught, then there probably isn't. But if they are feeling that, then there probably is. And, you know, you, you may need to have a conversation with the teacher just to see what's going on, you know? And something really quickly, thank you, Christina, for that, because I, I definitely agree um, with having that connection, like actually asking and being like, you know, so like what's going on, especially as a parent. I'm not a parent yet no time soon but um <laughs> no <laughs> but I but I do um have um I, I used to teach elementary school I teach you know college students now and I'm also around like a lot of nieces and nephews so I'm, I'm used to having a lot of children but having that conversation with a teacher and we're pretty much very open a lot of people just don't come and ask us but we will open we will ask questions but no one asks you know especially parents nobody asks parents don't talk to the teachers, which I'm like, you know, we're here, hey, but no one says anything. And um, I don't know if anybody's looking in the chat, but um, talk to the parents, explain as a parent, and also just email um, the teacher and be like, what what type of equity assignments do you have planned for the year? Bakuda has said that in the chat, so thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody else, if anybody else, oh, Dr. Ann, I see you have your hand raised. Um, if anyone else does have a question, you can, uh, answers for the question you can definitely put it in the chat because I am watching um time and everything but doctor you can go ahead because I saw you unmute yeah no I just want to say like and I put um I know Bakita um myself Dominique um said you know put the put the hands up I'm gonna say this as a as a as a teacher um and as a former educator I have a lot of opinions about parents and I will be I will be frank when I say that middle school I had to tap out because it just it just wasn't it became too combative you know 
no teacher, well, most teachers don't want to get into it with parents. If anything, we want to help. We want to know, like, if we know more, we can do more. But what I will say is, is I find that I, I think, and especially about the topic of this panel, right? It was like foundations, like family foundations. Education and the importance of education and the value in it is something that comes from home. There is nothing a teacher can do to change what happens when that kid is not with us. So if at your house, you're not taking the time, you're not, make, you're not making homework time a time when everybody is sitting down and everybody getting to work and everybody trying to like, let me see what you got to do today. Let me see. You know, I used to see like there are little indicators of things that families don't know that give us insight into how much you actually care. If I'm getting an assignment and I can't read it and the handwriting is illegible, I'm telling the parent, I'm like, I'm like, yo, like nobody, nobody looked at this and said, what's happening here? Like nobody said, I, this is chicken scratch. Let's fix this. And, and I'm, I'm Haitian. So at home that was no, like my mom in, like my mom was there, like English or no English. No, like you erase that. You guess that. No, you need to make it clean. It need to be clean. Que que <laughs> like, no, like you can't, there was a culture of respecting like the work and respecting that it's important. And, and a lot of families don't know this. I thought I would just share this is that in the educational world, we are being judged as black people before we even walk through the door. So they are telling people in the research that education and how much a child will attain in school and their achievement is related directly to the number of books in the household when the child is a baby. So I'm not, I'm not going to mince my words when I say we can't change what's at home. Only parents can do that. And we do need that help. It has to be that there is some value to what we trying to do so that we can work in partnership together to get your kids what, what every parent wants for their kids to be successful, for them to, to go to college, to make money, know how to read, all of that stuff. We all is, is, is in agreement, but if it's not in alignment in terms of how we approach people with that, in our community, I find that there's a big disconnect and that's why a lot, some of these conflicts continue to take place is that there's, we don't, you know, we're trying, but we can't do all the heavy lifting and we need to acknowledge that we do need more support and we do need more grace as teachers when things don't go the way parents want it, which is why my kid didn't get a high grade. Ma'am, I don't know who your kid is. Like, <laughs> I think I think we've had that conversation too. Like who? <laughs> so. Yeah. No, yeah, and um, and <laughs> everyone's kind of like blowing up in the chat when you when you did did a cold switch on us real quick. I love it. I love it. Do your cold switch, please. Do it. I I live for it. I'm waiting for it. Um, there's actually a few, and so it is 7:30. This is the part where it usually ends. I am gonna go four minutes over because we started five minutes late. There are a lot of questions that are coming up in the chat right now. A lot. Um. Oh, and some of them are actually already being answered and that's great. There is a question real quick um, before we go that somebody had asked, when assessing the, uh, the effects of student learning, do you think that there is a degree of significance around code switching that make the content easier for them to understand? Now, I'm not sure if anybody's like a you know linguistic buff like I am, because that's my area of study. Um, but if anyone wants to take that on very briefly, then you can go ahead or you can you know put it in the chat if you want to um i know me i'm i'm a linguistic buff so i have a lot to have say about two that. cents about it yes um, ma'am. okay <laughs> i've been reading uh, lisa del pitt's books um and she touches on this and look everybody knows and i, I was like oh my gosh there is a difference and that goes directly into what dr ann was saying about code switching they have to learn standard english to be able to cope in this world because we have to be honest with ourselves we don't have the power and if we want our kids to be successful we can't discount what they learn at home or what prior knowledge and experiences they come with but we have to also prepare them and the system is not going to accept their culture at home they think they have to fix our kids and i think that's the problem that i have with the school system they feel like our kids come into the school broken and they want to repair us. We're not broken. We have a we have our culture and we have a language. You may not understand it, but we have one. 
But I think in order for our kids to be successful, we have to tell them, don't change who you are, but you're gonna have to learn this method as well. So you do have different types of linguistics to go into the world with, but our kids aren't broken. And I think we need to express that to them at home every day. You're not broken. You don't have to be fixed. And another person real quick, I'll just put in there um, just to answer the question and just because of time. If you wanna look up um, Dr. April Baker Bell, she also has um, a very great combination of linguistic studies with black and brown children in the classroom. Uh, oh, I actually have a book right here. This right, <laughs> this right here, I live by this book. This book right here, um, Linguistic Justice, I'll put it in the chat. That's another thing to look at as well for the person that asked that question. Um, just so student, it gives a sense on how you can make students comfortable as far as code switching, their language, the history behind it, pedagogy practices in the classroom with black and brown students, all of that. Um, last question um, of the night, last question. Um, how are these CRPs being evaluated? Who is doing the evaluating? Is everyone a credible messenger? Now, I'm not sure if anybody can answer that. Um, if they want to, they can answer it right here in the Q&A. Um, or you can ask, answer it in the chat um, if anybody wants to go ahead and, and do that. If not, it's okay, because I am looking at time. We actually are like kind of out of time for that. But the great part about this is that it's technology and everyone has a social media or an email where they can continue to ask questions and everything. Um, this is the time now for all the panelists to go on the chat, drop your information, your social medias, your Twitter, your Instagram, your Facebook, your email. This is the time um, for you to do that, okay? So do that in chat. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen very quickly about um, what is going to be going on tomorrow. Tomorrow we are continuing the conversation with um, education, but now we're going to be talking about STEAM. So instead of STEM, it's going to be STEAM. Um, and I'm going to share that really, really quickly with you all. Okay, so here it is right here tomorrow. Um, great, another amazing group of panelists that's going to be coming on tomorrow, um, talking about the importance of STEAM in the Black and Brown communities um, and everything. So here's a little flyer for you. I'm going to drop my social media handles in, in it as well so you can share it with your networks. Um, okay, let me make sure I stop it. That is the end of our panel. I'm just blown away by all the information that was brought on tonight by everybody. Thank you all so, so much for all of, to all of our panelists for doing this. Um, we have to have conversations mm -hmm. like this. We have to, it has to keep going. Not just during Black History Month, don't get it twisted. We will talk about this again next month and the next month and the next month and the next month, <laughs> okay? It's not a Black history thing. It's something that we just need to talk about. So um, definitely going to be um, continuing the conversation throughout the year um, and for times to come. And I'm going to go ahead and drop my Instagram. Dr. Ann, yes, if you have a book recommendation, most certainly drop it in there. All of my social media handles are at Canon Favina. If anybody has any questions um, or would like to get in contact with the panelists, you can email me at this email right here. And this is your time to sign off or just say thank you to all of our panelists in the chat. Panelists, thank you so, so much. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. And we need to have like just a conversation just by ourselves. Hey, we need to go get some coffee. Like, no, get, yeah. some get your favorite. I'm like, listen, we need to kind of sit back and have a conversation just with y'all. I need I need to talk about some other things. <laughs> I actually think we should get we should get together and make an LLC and start to do PDs for the teachers out there and get. Oh, wait a oh, hold up. <laughs> listen, I'm I'm gonna be very, I'm gonna be very listen. I'm be very honest with everybody here. I'm a hustle ain't a problem for me, and I just, it's very hard to find. Um, it's very hard to find knowledgeable people that speak the truth. Right. And I think there were so many parallels with our own, with our experiences, with what we know, with like what we're sharing and like just